Good morning, good morning, good morning. Angry here. How are you? It's a lovely day in paradise. It's a Monday morning. <laughs> Haven't worked many Mondays lately. Full week ahead. Up early this morning. decided to come this way because of the uh, I assume that they lifted the roadworks because it's another week isn't it but they've still got diversion signs up so we'll have to wait and see if we can get through traffic is coming the other way how are you anyway all right spent the weekend in the back garden trying to subdue the grass and various living things a lot of grass got murdered over the weekend in my place. I've got a tractor with a cutter on the back. Just a, what they call a topper. It's just a rotating blade. It's about four feet and five feet in uh, diameter. And, but the tractor is a nightmare to try and keep the tractor going. It went for a while when I bought it and then it, uh, kept getting flat batteries because I didn't connect the disconnect the battery over the winter and then uh, the tires kept puncturing the front tires because I've got hawthorn hedges and so they would run over a hawthorn and then so when I went out I would have to do a puncture repair on the tire and then then I find that I couldn't start it because the battery was flat and then by then it was too late to cut the grass so I bought a new battery for it and then I ended up spending about 400 quid on two armour plated tyres with Kevlar reinforcements because they don't do solid tractor tyres anymore so um, these, these, these must be racing tyres these the only thing I can think I mean Kevlar reinforced tyres are there to try and stop prevent blowouts aren't they not to uh, you know they're trying to avoid people being injured by people pieces of tyre flying off if the tyre explodes at high speed but anyway, these things never go faster than 12 miles an hour, so they're not going to blow up. But uh, they have produced, they have, um, they they have uh, turned out to be remarkably puncture resistant. I must say, haven't had a puncture yet. And uh, and then uh, the tractor kept losing power. So then that turned out to be water in the carburetor, you know, in the in the uh, fuel filter so I had to drain that off and then it was still losing power so that turned out to be just general horrible black slime in the fuel line so I had to disassemble all that and blow all that clear and then uh, then uh, the tank which had the diesel in it you know the, the storage tank developed a leak so I've had to decommission that so but fortunately um, which is a shame because you can get cheap diesel if you're um, a farm you know, or if you've got a farm in your title, <laughs> farm. If your house is called something something farm, you can get away with quite a lot if your house is called something something farm. You can order a load of uh, noxious chemicals that uh, they're not not available to the general public, and uh, it helps when uh, you know you're ordering to have the farm in the title because they're not going to come round and check whether you're a my accountant said my farm was a toy farm. Actually, it wasn't the accountant, it was the his secretary. She, that, this is a, <laughs> my accountant was, was a, a nice guy, I liked him. He was expensive and useless, but very pleasant. And uh, like most accountants. And, uh, you know, we, we had some apples uh, one year because it used to be an apple farm and the guy who sold it had left a few trees planted. He grubbed most of them up under this uh, you know, scheme whereby he got paid to pull up his trees. But he left a few and uh, so we had some apples and then um, we didn't, you know, my kid, children and their friends picked them all and then we had a, I don't know, we had a few tonne. 
So I decided to sell them to the local uh, Apple, you know, the guy who collects all the apples locally and he paid us a bit of money for them and I happened to mention that, you know, I said, do we have to declare this as income? And the secretary said, well, it's not really, it's not really a farm, is it? She said, it's, a, it's like, it's only like a play farm or a toy farm or something. <laughs> so, I was, that pissed me off so much. You get all these things that I'm telling you about because I remember them because they pissed me off so much. But the point was not that, you know, that was quite insulting. It was insulting because uh, it was a serious question about <clears throat> a declaration of taxable income and not, <clears throat> you know, not an attempt to assert that I had a fully working farm in any way at all. And she was sort of quite flippant about the thing and like, what, what she said was something she thought, which was, you know, is it, a, is it, can we argue that it's a proper farm? Probably not. And yet that came out of her mouth. <laughs> she said, well, it's not really a proper farm, it's a toy farm. So, you know, and that in a way, it was her saying to me, you know, well, that's a bit of a stupid question. You know, because that's not, that's a bit ridiculous of you to ask that, you know what I mean? Because really, you're, you're pretending to be a farmer, but you're not, you know, you're asking me a sort of a question that a farmer might need to know, but you didn't need to know that because you're a dentist. You just happen to live on a farm. So, or, you know, so, and that really, really, that one comment was just such a, a stupid thing to say, and, but so, uh, she didn't realize that she'd even said it. Do you know what I mean? It was like, it's funny how sometimes people can say things and thoughtlessly, uh, but, but some people are thoughtless, aren't they? They don't, they, I mean, they're just generally thoughtless. They don't have thoughts. <laughs> just, <laughs> their thought process is not, you know, as fully developed as some other people's. So. Anyway, so what should we talk about today? Let's talk about, let's talk about, ah, oh, okay. Today I'm getting a big lump of money, well it's not big actually, it's pretty pathetic, into my bank account from Dentists and General Mutual Benefit Society, DGMBS, which is uh, a mutual society which is set up to um, provide cover against times when you can't work. It's a sickness and disability indemnity. It's not an insurance because it's not, you know, it's a mutual so basically the members are technically get together and they decide what benefits they want to pay for and who, you know, is entitled to uh, what's it. I've got the, um, well enough, my, my apportionment certificate came through today. And the way it works is you pay a certain amount a month and then you're entitled to so much benefit a week. And the attraction of doing it through something like this is that the your money goes into the mutual fund, um, but because you're a member of the, of the mutual fund, uh, when you cease to become a member, you get your money back. So, and in the meantime, the benefits are paid out of the fund according to, you know, how much the members decide to pay. and. Uh, it's all invested on your behalf, so uh, it's a sort of a happy days, you know, win-win. The, the problem is, it's not quite as happy as it sounds, because, I mean, I was, I was paying quite a minimal amount in, I think it was something like £90 a month, or it, latterly it was £120 a month or something, and my level of benefit was about £150 a week. And I mean, you might say, well, it's 150 pounds a week is, is nothing, you know? I mean, what's the point of a dentist insuring his income for 150 pounds a week if he's sick? And the answer is probably if you aspire to the sort of income that most dentists earn while you're sick, then uh, not much point at all. But, you know, but then you have got on the other hand, the fact that it's supposed to be an investment and, um, and also having been on the the Benevolent Fund, Board of Directors, or the or the British Dental Association, but the BDA Benevolent Fund, as they insist in having it called. Um, 
you know, I know that for some dentists under certain circumstances, 150 pounds a week is a lot. So uh, anyway, but the point was that I never ever, I'm not, you know, I don't, uh, <clears throat> I don't go sick unless I'm dying. In fact, I've been known to come into work on days when I don't even have any patients. So uh, I haven't ever claimed on it, never ever claimed on it. And I think I've been doing it for about 20 years. And, I, and after 55, you're entitled to um, what they call a terminal bonus, which is like a share of the invested funds. But, you know, I mean, all this sounds like a fantastic package on the face of it. But if you start to get the old spreadsheet out and have a quick look and see what is actually going on, I've got a sneaking suspicion that it's not quite as good as you think. It's the the uh, insurance-based um, uh, alternatives, like I think medical sickness is usually is probably the best known one in my generation anyway, MSS. And they give you like a more benefit and they give you it quicker, but it doesn't, it's not really long term, you know, it's just designed to cover you for short, periods it's for a dentist who does want to who has got his children at private school and does want to pay his bills if he's off sick um, but the premium's higher and then and obviously the premium is completely lost so um, yeah so but, but you don't get the premium back with the MSS so you get more they pay more but then obviously they take more the if you look at the accounts of these of this these mutuals they are quite secretive in that they only like produce a sort of a headline summary which they send out to the members and obviously most members that's really all they have a quick glance at the and it's not addressed up like a newsletter you know when we um, when we did our um, uh, accounts for the uh, DDPA you know as a as a trade union we used to have to and, and we were a mutual we used to have to make it quite clear. We, we had to send out the communication separately. You're not really supposed to dress up a technical communication as a newsletter, you know, because people will, will then look at it as a newsletter and they say, oh, well, no, I'm not interested in news from DGMBS. I'll, I'm going to chuck that in the bin. So I've got, for my, my £100 a month or whatever, I've got about uh, 20,000 20, back, right? Which sounds like a massive amount of money, but in fact, it's actually only what I've given them. They have given me back what I gave them. <laughs> the difference is they're giving it back to me in a lump sum, and I gave it to them £100 a month. So it feels as though I'm getting more than I gave them, but in fact, I think I gave them more than I'm getting back. And that's quite astounding when you consider that... Uh, when you consider that if you gave someone £100 a month to invest over 20 years, you would actually expect quite a bit more. I would expect quite a bit more than 20 grand back. Oh, dear. I mean, what's 20? What's 20,000 divided by 100? It's 20, isn't it? If I remember, I mean, you know, my maths is correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. 20,000. 20,000. Is it 200 months? It's 200, it's 200 times 100, isn't it? So I'm getting 200 months worth of subscriptions back. So, yeah, which is about, you know, as I say, it's broadly speaking, it's comparable. Now, you can say, well, okay, uh, uh, Angry, you've had uh, you've had 150 pound a week insurance cover out of that, and that is true. I have. The fact that I've never claimed on it is neither here nor there. It's it's uh, it's you know, I mean, it's there for me if I needed to claim on it. So. Fair enough. What you, what the clever people do, I think, is is claim on it. What you do is you find out. It's like the old days of the NHS. You find out what the DEB, what the DPB will will approve. You know, because they've got a secret list of of uh, fees that they pay. And if you're in, you know, if you're in the know and you know what the secret list is, then you can claim those fees. And I think that these. I can't believe DGMBS. I can't believe everybody's like me and nobody ever claims. Because there's not, there's no, it's not like there's a no claims bonus or anything. It's a mutual. 
they can't chuck you out for claiming. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure uh, people have, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a complete industry of claiming on these, uh, claiming on these funds. Um, and it's sort of borne out a bit by the annual report because they say uh, in the report they say what are the you know the, what are the biggest reasons for claiming, and I think the biggest reason is infection. <coughs> infection. And and you think so? Okay, infection. I mean that's by far and away the biggest category. So what you know <laughs> you sort of expect it to be back pain, don't you? <laughs> but it's not. It's infection. So what you're thinking? Well. What on earth, what infection, what infection do dentists get, which is so bad, that it's the major cause of days lost for dentists, you know? And I, I'd imagine it's probably something like the common cold. <laughs> I should imagine that they, you know, the dentists who have, uh, you know, perhaps the ones who are on a better screw than 150 pounds a week, uh, you know, decide that, uh, you know, they have got an infection therefore they should claim on this policy that uh, that uh, they've had for years and years and years and, and yet never claimed on but um, no I am I am you know I'm, and also I mean you say well why angry you're still working why have you cashed this thing in the answer is it's denominated in pounds like you know as you know I'm becoming increasingly concerned about the purchasing power of the pound, you know, my pounds, my, you know, I'm starting to hear people more and more saying, like there was a story in the paper the other day about how there's there so many million pound houses in the country, you know, the, the, the number of houses worth a million pounds has shot up. And that is, you know, in my opinion, my humble opinion, that is just totally the, the wrong way to look at it. What you're looking at there is the, the decline in the purchasing power of the sort of the, how Harold Wilson called the pound in your pocket. <laughs> it's, you know, it's decreasing. Inflation decreases the purchasing power of the pound every year. And here I am sitting, I'm paying into a fund, which is basically just giving me my money back at the end of the day in a greatly devalued form, you know? So the logic, and I am very hot on logic, the logic is not to, uh, not to sit on any money you know not sit on a on anything that's measured denominated in money in, in pounds because the purchasing power of that and, and it is borne out by my personal experience you know when I started paying into this thing it was um, it was like 90 pounds a week or 90 pounds a month or something and uh, I think it was even less it might have been 50 when I started and 120 when I finished like 20 years later and you know they they uh, they have kept the premium up to date with inflation. You know that they, they insisted that they they as the purchasing power of my subscription decreased. They insisted that I up the up the premium because they couldn't purchase as much with the fifty pounds. You know in the later years, so they said no, we want more than fifty, one hundred and twenty. So I dutifully. Uh, gave them more pounds so that they could carry on, you know, to maintain their purchasing power. And have they have they safeguarded my purchasing power? You know, have they put my money to good use? Is it really can twenty thousand pounds buy as much now as it could have done in the nineties when I took the put, took the policy out? And I think the answer is probably no. I think when inflation is taken into account, I don't think I really got a very good deal. I might have got the best deal available, but I didn't, you know, really you are, and also, you know, the, the funds, you get a share of the funds, but they don't really give you much of a share of the funds. I mean, this uh, mutual is worth 40 million. You know, I, I am a member of an association that's worth 40 million, and I think they've given me a couple of thousand out of that, you know, there you go, right, cheerio, thanks very much. There's your share, a couple of thousand. The real beneficiaries, in my opinion, of these mutuals are the um, people who run them. 
and uh, if you look through the annual report you'll find that uh, for the most part they're not dentists they are they are a mysterious breed of people who end up as the trustees of these uh, these mutuals mutuals are I mean I should know because the dental fusion is a mutual they are an opportunity to um, you know they're a sinecure you know if if you're uh, how can I put it once you get elected to the sort of board of directors of these things then people are pretty well uh, happy to let you carry on you know there's no it's not like there's a term of office um, and in fact uh, the the elections are coming up for the dentists in general and I think that the the people who are on the board are, are, seem to be pretty much the same people that were on the board um, 20 years ago when I started it all uh, reading the annual reports <clears throat> and you don't get um, you don't get much information about how much they're paid either they'll probably all say that they do it for nothing but I don't think they do I think at the very least they get a nice uh, they get a nice lunch every few months from the private bank that oversees the 40 million of my money that I've had to leave behind. Anyway, I'm out of it now. So, I'm going to invest my £22,000 in something else and see how I do. But honestly, I don't think I can do any worse. Alright, nice to talk to you. See you tomorrow. Bye.